Hello info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this relatively recent discovery, relatively recent announcement, from the Royal Ontario Museum. The announcement regarding this relatively incredible discovery of some of the first brains on our planet. And in this case, extremely well-preserved brains, and the brains inside creatures that existed approximately half a billion years ago, and very likely represent the first brains developed on our planet. And for me personally, this is an incredible discovery for one simple reason. Well, if we want to understand if there is intelligent life somewhere out there, we obviously have to understand intelligent life right here on planet Earth first. And in order to understand intelligence, we kind of have to understand what's going on inside the brain, and obviously how the brain formed as well. The evolution of this unusual and extraordinary organ is really where it's all at. If we can figure out how the brain formed on our planet, we can maybe start making assumptions or conjunctions in regards to the development of intelligent life elsewhere. For now, we're still in the dark, and for now, we're actually still scratching the surface. With this new study that you can find in the description below, by the scientists from this museum in Toronto, essentially taking us slightly closer to understanding how all of this works. But before we talk a little bit more about this, I also wanted to mention this book that I originally discovered through one of my most incredible professors back in the days, Catherine Bellomo, who introduced the book known as Wonderful Life by Stephen Jay Gould, that had some groundbreaking messages in regards to the evolutionary biology. It discusses the discoveries from Canada from the area known as the Burgess Shale, where nearly a century ago, the scientists discovered a huge amount of incredible fossils extremely well-preserved fossils, and fossils that led to the identification of some of the most incredible animals that have ever lived on planet Earth. Animals that sometimes were extremely difficult to identify, but also animals that eventually became iconic. Like this one right here, this is the top predator of the time, the shrimp-looking Anomala caris. All of these animals existed roughly around 500 million years ago on the planet, and their appearance was extremely sudden. And in one of the previous videos, that should be somewhere in the description below, I've actually discussed at least one potential event that might have resulted in the formation of these unusual animals. But that's of course just correlation. In reality, we have absolutely no idea how a lot of these animals suddenly appeared, or what forces of nature resulted in the production of so many unusual features in many of these creatures. Although today this particular event is usually referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. Something that happened 540 million years ago, and the word explosion in this case simply refers to the explosion of the diversity of life. Something that basically happened in just a few million years, but also something that ended just as abruptly. And if you ever see the pictures of these unusual animals, you will notice that many of them have some really strange features. Almost alien-like features. And that's essentially how I personally was introduced to this topic over a decade ago, when back in the days my professor essentially gave us these toys that looked like this to play around with. And though it might sound silly, the actual goal is for us to figure out what some of these features were for. For example, what exactly is this long nose and long unusual formation for? Or here is the iconic creature known as Hallucinogenia. The scientists could not believe that it was even real. Here the question was a lot easier. Which way is up? Which of these are legs and which are spikes? Or where is the front, where is the back? And though we were doing this just for fun in class and just to understand the scientific process, in reality this particular creature led to some of the most heated discussions back in the days when it was originally discovered. And frankly, even today, the scientists are still not certain about what's going on with this unusual animal. But there are several main arguments made in this book. First of all, a lot of these features that used to exist in these animals no longer exist today and could not even be understood what they were for. The majority of these animals are extinct and none of their features get transferred to anyone else. But the other point is in regards to the adaptation to the environment. The reason most of these animals went extinct and only some of them survived, like this one right here, known as Pikaia, today is believed to be the ancestor of pretty much all vertebrates on the planet. Basically, this is our grand 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 father or mother. We're not sure if they even had genders. And so the fact that some of these creatures survived and not the others is really due to unpredictable sequences of various events where some animals just got lucky to have certain features that helped them survive. Whereas other animals did not. They disappeared when the conditions on the planet changed enough to make life no longer hospitable for those particular species. But if we were to somehow replay all of these events in, for example, a parallel universe, 
he also argues that there's a high chance that things would work out completely differently. It was really due to chance that some animals survived and some didn't. It was not some specific feature these animals worked on very hard in order to survive a potential extinction event. He just some of them got really lucky. Like for example for Pikaya, there's a chance that they might have been living inside the sand, allowing them to survive certain events that caused a lot of other life to perish over time. In other words, they weren't really planning to hide in the sand for millions of years, but because they were in the sand, whenever the conditions in the water changed dramatically or whatever caused the extinction of other animals, did not affect the fortunate Pikaya. Eventually, half a billion years later, leading to the evolution of the most complex brain on the planet. And he also argued that evolutionary fitness does not really guarantee survival especially when the conditions on the planet change too dramatically. And so the traits that helped some animals to become really prolific would not necessarily guarantee their survival further on. There's another term that applies to this known as exaptation, which refers to the additional feature that somehow becomes beneficial, but usually completely by accident. A commonly used example here are bird feathers. And so even though we believe that feathers originally evolved to help regulate temperature inside the body of early animals, over time, some of their features have also started to be used by animals that took flight. In other words, they started to become a kind of an aid for flying animals. And one of the most iconic animals discovered in the Burgess Shale, and the animal that Stephen Gould described as the most important discovery ever, is the fossil of an animal known as Opabinia. Kind of looked like this. The creature with five eyes, unusual frontal nozzle, but also a lot of internal features that no longer exist in anything on the planet. And according to Gould, this right here has taught us so much more about evolution than anything else before. And that includes the iconic T-Rex. But one of these strange and unusual features produced in some of these animals is the feature that did survive, even though the five eyes or the lone unusual protrusions didn't. And the feature we're talking about is sort of visible in this, the first brain ever discovered on the planet. This was in a similar animal that existed 520 million years ago, originally discovered back in 2013. The organ that, unlike other organs in other strange animals, did survive. Now before I forget, quick side note, and a super important side note. Remember how I mentioned, a lot of these features that existed in these animals no longer exist. Once these Cambrian animals went extinct, all of their strange, weird, unusual formations was snuffed out of existence. But this part right here did not. This part survived. Not all of them had this part, but some really lucky animals did. And the evolution of those lucky animals eventually led to this. Which is, once again, according to Gould, was basically a series of lucky events. If we were to go back in time and replay these events, according to Gould and a lot of evolutionary scientists, things would most likely work out differently. Those animals that possess brain might have not survived, for one reason or another. And Pikaya that did have a small brain inside of it, might have become one of those unlucky extinct animals, which by far is one of the most important supports of the idea of rare earth hypothesis. The idea that life is most likely extremely rare on our planet, and the idea that intelligent life is even more rare. Brains are simply an accident. Anyway, moving on. Let's discuss the surprise discovery from just a few weeks ago. For the first time ever, the scientists discovered an extremely preserved collection of different brains and of course the nervous system, in animals that lived over 500 million years ago. But unlike the previous discovery, this time they are preserved so extremely well. But in this case, this did not come from the animal that evolved into us. It came from an animal that resembled that iconic animal or caries. This is another species known as Stanley caries, slightly smaller, only about 8 centimeters in length, but surprisingly to the scientists, containing the nervous system that seems to resemble the ones we find inside spiders, horseshoe crabs, or modern scorpions. But I guess the surprise here is that it was already super complex even back then. And there were approximately 80 of them discovered in total. Which suggests that this is probably going to lead to new discoveries in evolutionary biology, and specifically the evolution of the brain and the eventual formation of intelligence. But even this preliminary study has already discovered incredible amount of detail in some of these brains. For example, a large part of the brain is dedicated to visual processing. Very likely because this animal seemed to have had three eyes, with the middle eye, whose real purpose is uncertain, potentially forming from two smaller eyes that develop over time. 
And one of the main reasons why so much of the brain was essentially visual processing was really because this was a predator, very similar to Anomalocaris. Similar to this one right here that was slightly bigger, growing up to half a meter in size. And these were basically the T-Rexes of their time. They were the top predators, and so they had to have the right tools for the job. And vision was most likely one of them. Although interestingly, Stanley Caris right here seems to be the smallest member of this unusual species, and seems to contain an extra eye as well. But more importantly, there is an unusual feature that was recently discovered in the study that suggests there were two main components in the brain connected to two different parts. One was connected to vision, but the other was connected to the frontal claws. And in modern animals, for example in modern spiders, there are often even three segments. And up until now, it was unknown when this particular feature evolved. And so it looks like the ancestors of spiders, crabs, and scorpions, whose fossils we don't really have, might have even evolved three parts compared to the two parts of Stanley Caris. And of course, the discovery of the third eye is also a bit of a mystery as well. At the moment, no idea what it's for, or if other animals had it as well. With some other features that were discovered that do not exist in animals today, also being things like the number of segments. In most modern animals, usually the number of segments is even. 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. In these animals, it was 17, a prime number. This is also something that did not survive the extinction of post-Cambrian age, and something else that got removed from the gene pool. But because this is such a recent discovery, there's still so little we know about this brain, or how these brains eventually led to our brains. And that's of course one of the most important questions here. How and why all of this evolved on the planet, and more importantly, can this happen again elsewhere? At the moment, based on what we know about our planet, the chances for this are extremely low. And so looking for extraterrestrial intelligence somewhere out there, without studying our planet and understanding how and why things evolved the way they evolved here, is actually not really what we should be doing just yet. Because the current research in extraterrestrial intelligence really seems to be a kind of a guesswork. We're sort of assuming that aliens are going to have similar features like the brain, the intelligence, the ability to communicate using, for example, radio signals. All of those assumptions are based on our own planet and our own understanding of how we live. That's survivorship bias. That's not really scientific. But this right here, this is one of the most important discoveries of the last few decades. And it will most likely teach us so much more about potential extraterrestrial intelligence than any telescope on the planet. At least that's my take on it. And that's why I'm going to be following up with this particular study and all of these discoveries in some of the future videos. So subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else. And maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.